I would like to talk about data and file structures and a way of motivation trying to explain why you should care. This is an example workflow that we have in maybe some architectural analysis. And so you can see that we start maybe with some data collection using Trimble software. It has its own format. We have to export it to Surfer, a common powerful tool for 3D data processing. And then we might export those outputs to Esri and from there to a special vector works for some more analysis. And then we might do some visualization or calculations in Autodesk and then out to Eagle Point software for some additional structural calculations and then Photoshop for the output that we're going to show our client. And each of these transitions would entail either one software interpreting the other software's format or a format conversion in the software. And so you have to be careful when you're doing these kinds of analyses to make sure that the data structures handshake correctly. Here's another example in this hydrological analysis, the same sort of idea where I start with Trimble and go through various processing engines and end up with some analysis in R. Suffice it to say the format conversions are common. If you aren't careful about them, you get something like this. Here's the data we want. Here's the data we end up with. And analysis on that is going to be gobbledygook. So you have to have some understanding of the internal structuring. Of course, data are stored at the computer level as binary bits. So you have bytes that are 8 bits and you create numbers. Just like in the base 10 system here where we have the value 13 is 1, 10, and three ones in the binary version that 13 is going to be one one zero twos one four and one eight those add up to 13. So we can create any decimal equivalent with a binary number and if we decide that there's going to be a sign bit we can make it positive or negative so a sign bit might be zero for positive and one for negative and then we can also decide part of our binary sequence is going to be for the decimal part that is to the right in a real number of the decimal point and part to the left. So we can create basically any number in this binary system but we often have to specify what we're going to store both in a raster or in a vector coordinate location or in the attributes associated with them. And the decision we make defines how we can treat that data. Now, the safest thing is usually to make things all float because those can be interpreted for all the other types. But float take up more space because you generally want to store really large numbers and you have both a decimal point and the whole part. So we often have to say a size. And if uh, we're worried about space constraints in our system or throughput for our computer. We might make things that are only going to be positive integers, right? There's no bit for sign. They might be positive integers and no part to the right of a decimal point. There is no de decimal point. Or if we have really small things, categorical data, we can make bytes or sub-byte, 8 bits or 4 bits to store something. The problem is if we interpret these incorrectly, that is if we assume it's byte, when it's actually real or in reverse, assume it's real when it's actually byte, we'll get the wrong data. And so when we create our data, we have to think about that. And then it's complicated because different systems sometimes store integers with and without sign bits differently. And, and so there's lots of opportunities for mistranslation. So you have to check every time you do a workflow the first time through and make sure these translations occur and get in to the nitty gritty. And also when you're creating your data, you have to be careful to think about what's in the, each of the cells, what's in each of the attributes, and then make sure you don't do an analysis operation like take the square root of a binary data that's storing categorical information. So you just got to know sort of the basics about these constraints with the system you're working on and they're system specific. Another thing that's sometimes maddening is there's many different data formats. There's TIFFs, there's shapefiles, there's geopackages, geodatabases. There's a bunch of different image formats, a bunch of different system formats. And they're sometimes complicated. A real common example of mistake folks make is with shapefiles. Esri, the Environmental Systems Research Institute, is the largest vendor of GIS software out there, and they came up with this thing called a shapefile. 
which really isn't really a single file for a set of data. There's a minimum of three files, SHS, DBF, and SHP, to really get spatial data. And then there were additional files, I think up to nine, that were included to add additional utility to those data. And if you didn't have all these files together, or at least these three, you didn't really have data that were useful. And so you had to be careful to not, if somebody says, can I have a shapefile, just send them the SHP file for this particular data set, because that's useless in and of itself. Um, so you have to send all the parts, or you have to send most of the parts. Now you might think, well, this is just one data set, although it was a very commonly used and still is data set. The same thing happens with TIFFs. You, if you leave out some pieces, you're not going to get all the information in the TIFF. Now folks have tried to alleviate that in various ways. One is to put everything in headers. Another is to basically package everything. And so there's this um, open geospatial standard thing called the geo package, which basically combines all the information you need into one file. And then the file's well-defined. The, the way to handle it and process it is out there. And so you can pull it apart and uh, folks know how to do that. Esri did the same thing, came to their own conclusion, and created this thing called a geodatabase, which is a folder with files, multiple files in it. Now, you can still mess these up if you go in the files in the folder and muck around deleting things, but hopefully you're smart enough not to do that, and so you can pass these packages off. Now, again, you have to be careful to make sure that the software that you use can parse your package, but software is getting better at that. Just you have to check the first time through. There are a few other things we do to data, mostly to raster data, but sometimes to vector. For example, the data sets are often quite large raster data, and we can compress them. There's many different kinds of compressions that do various things. I want to note we want to make sure in GIS we use lossless, that is, compressions that don't lose any data. So there's a forward to compress and a inverse to decompress, and we want to get exactly the same output when we go forward and back as we started with. A lossy compression, you can go forward and then come back, and you don't have exactly the same data. It changes things. A lot of common in image processing techniques really compress the data, but you lose information. The image is changed. And that's fine if you're just going to view something. You can stand some loss because it's often imperceptible, but if you're measuring something or using the data for analysis, losing information is usually not acceptable in a GIS. Here's a simple and basic kind of compression for raster. So I have, it's called a run length code. And what I do is I have a run of data, like there's two nines, that's a run of two. And then there's five sixes, that's a run of sixes. And so I keep track of the length, two nines, five sixes, one seven. So I have six bits of information here that store eight. And so when I have long stretches that are the same, I can really get a lot of compression. So here's eight sixes. Instead of eight bytes, if that's the case, I can just use two bytes to store that information. If this run were to go on for a thousand, I could get a thousand bytes of information in just two bytes. So great compression. Now it doesn't always work. If you have highly variable data, you can actually take more space. So here's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve pieces of information to store what are in these eight here. So you don't use run length coding for highly variable data. You would never use it for real data. But for categorical data, a land cover where the land cover patches are fairly homogenous, it's a great way to compress it. There's a bunch of other compression techniques out there, but you just have to know because sometimes some inputs don't like compressed data. You have to be careful how you pass the data back and forth. One thing you'll often get asked is uh, basically, do you want to pyramid the data? And so the notion is here for image data, especially when I'm viewing it, if I'm viewing it zoomed way out over a large area, I don't need all the information. I can't even see it on the screen. I might have literally millions of pixels, but I can only see a few hundred thousand on the screen at one time. And so there's no reason to try and display all those. Yet if I only have my raw data, the original data, only at this level, your computer has to go through and pick out the every hundredth one and display that. What you could do is you could say, look, okay, I'm gonna do half resolution and quarter resolution. So here I'll basically take every other pixel and every fourth and every eighth and every 16th and save that 
And then when a person asks to view the data, I look at what resolution spans the area they want to look at. So if I have a screen that's a thousand pixels, I get I find that the eighth resolution has a thousand pixels across. That's what I display and I have to show a lot less data and I have to sample. I just paint everything across instead of calculating where to pull the data from. So this makes the raster image itself or the vector, I'm sorry, the, the raster spatial data larger because I'm saving each of these levels, but that may be at uh, the advantage of displaying much more rapidly. So we do both. This is sort of a way of making the data access quicker at the cost of space, or I can make the data in run length coding access more slowly, but at the cost of um, saving space or at the advantage of saving space. So we do both of those things, just so you're familiar with them.